Hi there, and welcome to this 30-minute webinar on reporting Scope 2 market-based emissions. Um, we're running this webinar in response to several of our clients' questions around Scope 2 market-based reporting to assist companies in how to um, understand whether or not they should be reporting their market-based emissions, how to do so, and to understand what the benefits might be. Um, this webinar should be around 30 minutes long, and we'd ask you to submit questions through the GoToWebinar question function, or to email them to us using the contact details we'll provide at the end. And slides will be made available to all attendees. Okay, so the contents that we're going to cover today, we're going to review what the emission scopes are, to put things into context before going into discussing the Scope 2 GHG protocol guidance. Uh, then we're going to talk about the location-based methods compared to the market-based methods and how these combine to make dual reporting. We'll then discuss in a bit more detail about the market-based methods and then some of the contractual instruments around them, such as energy attribute certificates, energy contracts, and supplier-specific emissions factors before going through a worked example and discussing how Greenstone Environment Module can be used to help with your reporting. And finally, going over some steps towards calculating your scope to emissions. Uh, but before we start, just to give you a bit of context about Greenstone. Um, Greenstone are a leading global provider of non-financial reporting software and services. We help clients across multiple industries and throughout 100 different countries to define, measure, manage, and report their non-financial aspects of their business. And our software modules cover the environment, health and safety, corporate social responsibility, and supplier portal information. We're aligned to several of the, um, several of the key non-financial reporting frameworks such as the CDP and the GRA. Okay, so to give you some context of the different emission scopes and how the scope two market market based emissions fit within that. Um, the GHG protocol categorizes emissions into three broad categories. So scope one emissions, these are direct emissions from fuel use in company vehicles and facilities. For example, natural gas used in your boilers for heating purposes, or diesel and petrol used in your company cars. Scope 2 emissions, these are generated by acquired and consumed electricity, steam, heating, or cooling. So in other words, this is the energy that you buy from your suppliers and that you use on your sites. Um, these are, scope 2 emissions are considered indirect emissions as they're generated by your energy suppliers upstream of your operations. Scope 3 emissions, these are also considered indirect emissions, which occur throughout your supply chain, either upstream or downstream of your operations. Um, some examples being waste collection, your water supply, or tr any transport which isn't owned by the company. So it could be business travel or commuter, commuter travel. Um, the remainder of this presentation is going to focus on Scope 2 emissions, um, which represent one of the largest sources of GHG emissions globally. So the production of electricity and heat now accounts for at least a third of global GHG emissions. And for many companies, your Scope 2 emissions represent quite a significant proportion of your overall carbon footprint. Okay, so the GHG protocol. The GHG protocol provides a standard set of rules for accounting and reporting on your greenhouse gas emissions, and it's the most widely used methodology for corporate accounting of GHG emissions. Back in 2015, they published new guidance on how to report Scope 2 emissions, which was known as the market-based methodology. Um, before this, the, the only tool that companies really had to reduce their emissions was to make energy efficiency improvements in their sites or to install uh, low or zero carbon um, generating technology on their sites. 
Um, but now with market-based reporting, they can also demonstrate emissions reductions through their purchasing decisions. This is important as, as more and more low or zero carbon energy options become available. Um, and initiatives like the RE100 continue to promote the adoption of renewable energy. Companies want to ensure that the full benefits of their purchasing decisions are reflected within their emissions reporting. Um, and as you can see, other frameworks such as the CDP and GRI standards, they've also started to align with this new Scope 2 guidance. So yeah, it's important to note that this, this guidance isn't new. It was published in 2015. Um, but we're still seeing that not everyone has really adopted it uh, fully as yet. And there's still quite a few questions around it, which has prompted this webinar. OK, so before we discuss the market-based method, just wanted to explain quickly the location-based method. So location-based emissions reporting is the traditional way, traditional way in which companies would measure and report their scope to emissions. This is where emissions factors are calculated for regions or for nations based on the average emissions of all the energy sources being put onto the grid by using a defined geographic boundary and defined time period. This would include all sources of generation, including fossil fuels, nuclear, and any renewable energy sources within that geographical area. So the emissions factor hierarchy, which is the order in which emissions factors should be chosen based on their availability, indicates that the regional and sub-national emissions factors should take precedence over national emission factors. And the location-based method, this applies to all electricity grids. In contrast, the market-based method uses emission factors from specific generators that you're purchasing your electricity from. So emissions factors are derived from different contractual, in contractual instruments, such as energy attribute certificates, energy contracts, or from supplier-specific emissions data. These are presented in the emissions factor hierarchy. And we'll talk about these in more detail in the following slides. This method, the market-based method, applies to any market where there's consumer choice of different energy products or where there's supplier-specific emissions data available. For example, where companies or energy suppliers offer green tariffs for their electricity supply um, or where there's ability to purchase energy directly from renewable energy generators through power purchase agreements or other contracts. Any markets where those options are available, the market-based method does apply. In regions where the market-based method can be applied, the GHG protocol states that companies should report both their location and their market-based emissions, and this is known as dual reporting. There are several benefits to dual reporting. Companies can compare purchasing decisions of the GHG intensities of the electricity that they are using. They can carry out a complete assessment of their GHG impact, risks, opportunities associated with their energy purchasing decisions. And they can track and compare GHG emission information from different regions over time according to the different reporting methods. A key point to note here is that the GHG protocol does require dual reporting to take place where it's applicable. Um, and if you, if you aren't carrying out dual reporting where market-based options are available, then you're not in compliance with the GHG protocol corporate standard. OK, so using the market-based approach, we'll just have a look in more detail into the emissions hierarchy of the market-based method. At the top of the hierarchy, we have energy attribute certificates and energy contracts, such as power purchase agreements. So both of these can be used to demonstrate your scope to, scope to emissions. 
In the following slides, we'll go into more detail on these two. Next in the hierarchy is supplier-specific emissions factors. So this is where if suppliers are providing differentiated products, such as green tariffs, they should have a specific emissions factor associated with it. Again, we've got another slide on this later on. Next in the hierarchy is the residual mix. The residual mix is calculated once all certificates for renewable energy going onto the grid uh, have been accounted for. An emissions factor is calculated based on all of the uncertified energy. This is called, yeah, the residual mix. And if the residual mix is not available, then the location-based emissions factors should be used in the hierarchy of regional and subnational first, and then national. Okay, so going into a bit more detail in some of the contractual instruments. The first one we have is energy attribute certificates. EACs guarantee that every, for every megawatt hour of renewable energy going onto the grid, one certificate is produced and they indicate that the electricity is zero carbon. They, the, the, the different mechanisms vary depending on their location. So in the UK, they have renewable energy guarantees of origin. In the EU, they're called guarantees of origin. The US use renewable energy certificates. And then in other developing markets, there's international renewable energy certificates available. EACs are a tradable commodity, and they're traded on a separate market to the actual electricity which they're associated with. Um, in Europe, due to the common energy market and cross-border energy infrastructure, they can be openly traded, <coughs> but REGOs and RECs can't be traded internationally. They can be traded within the regions in which they're generated. So REGOs can be traded openly in the UK, and RECs can be traded within the US, but they can't be traded across borders. So for example, if REGOs were bought by a company in the UK, they can't be claimed or reported against their operations in Australia. And the hope is that this will encourage the development of renewable energy in, in regions where demand was previously low. Okay, energy contracts. These are also the top of the emissions factor hierarchy for the market-based reporting. In markets where energy attribute certificates aren't available, companies can use emissions factors from the contracts that they have with their energy suppliers. Power purchase agreements are typical contracts that companies use to buy electricity directly from a supplier. And these may be used to generate, uh, to convey the generation attributes, in other words, the emissions factors, if the contract includes a language that confirms the energy and the associated emissions are attributed to the buyer. Often an audit trail is required to demonstrate that no one else is claiming the benefit from the PPA. Supplier-specific emissions factors, these are next in the emissions factor hierarchy. So supplier-specific emissions factors are provided by energy suppliers for the different energy products which they supply. These may, these may be their standard energy products through their standard fuel mix, or they might be a specific green energy product or tariff. Uh, the GHG protocol defines green tariffs as a consumer option offered by an energy supplier distinct from the standard offering, which is fairly vague and it leaves it open to interpretation. But what we've seen is that these include a variety of different tariffs which might be renewable, low carbon, or a mix of different fuel sources, often sometimes including fossil fuels. The key point here is that it's important to check suppliers' emissions factors and just to check their fuel mix before making any claims that your green tariff is zero carbon. 
Okay, so now we're just going to talk through a worked example. Um, in this table, you'll see a hypothetical example of a company with operations in several different markets and how their emissions would differ based on using the location-based method compared to the market-based method. So if you look in the table, you can see that the UK, for example, has renewable energy certificates to cover all of their demand. So therefore, in the market-based total, they can put zero as their emissions. In Norway, we can see that no differentiated products such as certificates or contracts are available um, because they don't purchase them there. So in this instance, the residual mix is used. In China, we can see that there's no differentiated products available in that market. Therefore, it reverts back to the location-based emissions. Uh, we can also see that offices located in Spain only have 50% of their energy usage covered by PPAs, which means the remaining 50% of their emissions is calculated using the residual mix. And finally, in Brazil, they have energy contracts which cover 100% of their um, electricity consumption, and it's through zero carbon, uh, zero carbon purchases. So again, they can report zero as their market-based emissions. Um, within Greenstone, our environment module is geared up to help companies to record, track, and report both their location and market-based emissions. This can be done for all of their locations. Uh, this can help save reported significant time and effort in doing their calculations when it comes to their annual reporting and when it comes to reporting against frameworks such as the CDP or GRI. Lastly, we've got some steps which we recommend towards calculating your scope two emissions. So firstly, we recommend that you carry out a review of your current reporting and data collection processes, followed by identifying the GHG emission sources for your scope two emissions, and then determining whether or not the market-based method applies. So in this, you need to review whether or not those different products are available, such as energy attribute certificates or energy contracts, or if supplier specific emissions data is available. Then we recommend you collect your activity data or your consumption data and pick your emissions factors for each method. Then calculate your emissions and aggregate your emissions up to the corporate level. Well, thanks for listening. That's the end of this short webinar. Um, as I said at the start, if you've got any questions, feel free to get in touch via my email here, or you can pop the questions on the GoToWebinar question function. Thank you very much.